Hi, Jubilee. Great to be back with you this weekend. Um, it's been a surreal week, I know, for all of us in different ways. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's surreal when you drive around and see it so, um, in, in one hand, easy to drive, and then the other hand, when you realize why it's so easy to drive, um, it's, just, it's just such a surreal time for all of us. But I'm really glad you're joining us this weekend. I really think that God has something good for us. I know that uh, for so many people, they're expressing hope uh, towards us in what we're doing. And I just believe with all of my heart that this is true uh, and that this is right. That in times like these, this has not taken God by surprise. It's not caused him to be nervous. Uh, he, he was not unaware of this storm. And in fact, um, we're in the middle of this storm with his permission right now because he has a plan for us. And I want to get that across to all of us. None of this is uh, strange to him uh, as far as like being out of control or being uh, beyond his ability to do something good with it. I think it's an opportunity right now for the word of God and for the reality of God to reach people like it normally doesn't because we're so anesthetized with all of the stuff of life and the busyness of life and all of the things. And when that comes grinding to a halt, suddenly we become very aware of our own mortality, uh, our, our own fragility, and uh, in fact, the reality of our need for God. It becomes so apparent right now. So in the middle of all the difficulties, I have hope that God is doing something good. And I want to remind you, this is only temporary. This too shall pass. Put your hope in God and put your hope in that fact right there. We're going to be uh, okay. The name of our series is called Unshakable. We actually started it last weekend because of what's going on right now. Things are shaken. What remains though will be a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And that's God's primary purpose with us right now. I think it's important to hang on to that. So as I teach from this, uh, I've got a text that I'll share from Hebrews, uh, but before I jump in there, let me give two things to you that I think um, one is something you can do right now, and the other one is something to just kind of ponder. So the first one is this. Uh, I want to give a shout out to all of the people who are watching online. We reached over 7,000 people who actually watched uh, last weekend and through the week online, but primarily that was just on last weekend, more than 7,000 people. So far more than we reach in person over a weekend, we're reaching right now, and it's just fantastic. Uh, so I want to give a shout out to all of you, regardless of where you're listening from and how you're watching us. Welcome to the Jubilee family. And then also, something that we think would be fun for you, if you'd be willing to do this, in the comment section, uh, where you're watching from on the, on the app and on uh, through, the, through the website, jfc.org, and through, through the app, there's a comment section where you can kind of join in and participate with other people. And we would love for you, if you don't do anything else, we'd love for you to at least sign on and tell us uh, where you are watching from right now. We'd love to just gather uh, the church um, at large and, and have you all participate with us. And then the other one is a scripture that I want you to ponder. I found this scripture not quite a week ago, and I've seen it now circulate uh, all over the internet and all over the place. I want you to know I'm the source of where this scripture came from. So uh, this is Isaiah 26, 20. And even though the context of when this is written uh, does not apply to the coronavirus, this is what the word of God is able to do. It's active and it's alive and it speaks to us in any and all generations. So listen to how uncanny accurate this scripture is. Isaiah 26, 20. Come my people, enter your chambers and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself as it were, for a little while. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little while until this moment of indignation has passed us by. And that is just, in my mind, that is uncanny what, what, was, what was being said through Isaiah by God to the people then, and I think it can apply to us right now. Come, my people, so he's with us. Hide yourself in your chamber for a little while while this indignation passes by, and remember, it will pass by. Okay, let's jump in. It's called Unshakable. We're using Hebrews chapter 12, just these two verses this uh, weekend to begin with, 26, 27, 28, I guess it's three verses. When God spoke from Mount Sinai, his voice shook the earth. 
But now he makes another promise. Once again, I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens also. This means that all of creation will be shaken and removed if it can be. So how much is all? It's all of us. No one escapes this. It's not a North American thing. It's not a Chinese thing. It's not a South American thing. We're all going through this right now. So everything that can be shaken will be shaken and removed so that only unshakable things will remain. I want to say that right now. What's happening, only unshakable things will remain. Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. So this should not cause us to, to just find like uh, despair and anger and just like, oh, I, I just can't believe I'm fearful. This should cause us to recognize, man, that God is above all things and over all things and powerful through all things. And let us, let us use this time to turn to him and to worship him and, and to spend this time not in fear but in faith with who our God is. Uh, at the same time, this week, a friend of mine, a missionary from France that's here in America and goes to our church, uh, Eric and Rachel Dufour, they had sent out a newsletter talking about what's happening with coronavirus in uh, Europe and in Paris in particular. That's where they're from. They have this fantastic church there uh, in Paris, Martin Luther King Church. Um, and so they, um, I'm sorry, Martin Luther Church. And so they had uh, uh, included a, a writing from the great reformist Martin Luther that I included for today. Once again, this is from 500 years ago, but look at how uncanny uh, Martin Luther's words to the church then. So Martin Luther lived 200 years after um, the, the great black plague, bubonic plague, had swept through Europe and killed uh, approximately one half of, uh, of Europe. And um, less than 200 years, he's living in Wittenberg, Germany, when it outbreaks again. And as a minister, he's called to participate in, uh, imagine, imagine how it was 500 years ago. You think today we struggle with how to respond to it. Imagine 500 years ago. So he writes these words, and just listen to how uncanny accurate these words from 500 years ago are today. I shall ask God mercifully to protect us. Then I shall fumigate help purify the air, administer medicine and take it. I shall avoid places and persons where my presence is not needed in order to become contaminated and thus perchance inflict and pollute others and so cause their death as a result of my negligence. If God should wish to take me, he will surely find me and I have done what he has expected of me and so I am not responsible for either my death or the death of others. If my neighbor needs me, however, I shall not avoid place or person, but will go freely as stated above. See, this is such a God-fearing faith because it is neither brash nor foolhardy and does not tempt God. That's from the writings of Martin Luther, volume 43, page 132. Just amazing how uncannily uh, similar it is today, 500 years ago, and then what Isaiah wrote uh, 2,800 years ago. It's just amazing. So I think what it means is this, ultimately on this unshakable idea, that when things shake, and they do through the ages, this will not be the last time things shake, by the way. It may not be through the same, uh, same means, but things will shake again according to the Bible. But when they shake, the truth of the matter is, the things that can't be shaken are what remain, and it's what we can build on. It's the foundation we can build on. So hold on to that. So I want to talk this weekend about unshakable in a storm. I'm going to use a text that I have preached from before. Love this. It's Jesus in the storm. And we find in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, Jesus in at least three different storms with the disciples. How he handled those three storms is really interesting. This one is the familiar story where Jesus walks on the water. So uh, Mark chapter 6, uh, 45 to 52. Let me, let me read this to you. You can follow along if you have the notes online uh, immediately. Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them behind, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Now, just real quickly, because I'm familiar with this area around the Galilee, uh, the lake itself is 600 and some odd feet below sea level. So the surrounding hills that create a basin where the, where the Sea of Galilee is, all around the lake 
are vantage points that if you climb up just a little bit, you can see the lake. Now, uh, in their day and age, they called it a sea because it appeared to be so big. It's not a sea, it's a lake. But it's a really big lake, uh, harp-shaped. And so what, what we know from where the disciples were doing ministry, they had just fed the 5,000. That's why when it says immediately after this, they had just fed the 5,000 people. Immediately after this, Jesus told them to get into the boat go to the other side to Bethsaida. Um, so we know from where they were to where they were going, we know what part of the lake Jesus was on. So I know that part of the lake where he climbed up on the hills right there. It's a beautiful part of the Sea of Galilee, uh, very close to where the Sermon of the Mount took place. For those who have been with me, uh, it's just an incredible view. So he, Jesus, picture him on the side of this mountain. He's clearly able to see the disciples going into this storm. So get that, that picture, okay? So while he dismissed the crowd, after leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. And then later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on the land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them walking on the lake. He was about to pass them by. And that part right there, it's just interesting to me where, where his mind was and where the disciples' mind was. But when they, the disciples, saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost because seeing someone walk on the lake is, it, you know, this is not an everyday occurrence, right? They cried out. They're fearful uh, because they saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said this. And look at Jesus' words because they're as applicable for you right this moment as they were 2,000 years ago. Take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. So take courage. It is I. And do not be afraid. Those three sentences are so powerful. Then he climbed into the boat with them. And the wind died down. They were completely amazed. Uh, and then it includes this part. For they had not understood about the loaves. Remember, they just fed the 5,000 people with the fish and the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. Now, it includes that last part that seems so out of joint with the rest of the story because there's a significant issue with that, and I'll come to it at the end. So if you've got a pen or a pencil or using the online notes, uh, here's, here's what you fill in with it, right? Uh, the first one is, is this. He, Jesus, sent them into a storm. Okay, the storm is not accidental. The storm is not unsuspected by Jesus. He's not caught off guard with this. Now, the disciples had no idea. And I think the truth of the matter is, um, because the Gospels record three different times that the disciples got into a boat and ended up in a storm, the first time, they're, they're, um, uh, they're oblivious. The second time, maybe they start to become aware. The third time, right? Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. A third time, what, what is that right there? So we don't know if this is uh, the second or the third storm, right? But we do know this has already happened to them. So uh, you, you would think that they would have calculated that there's a possibility that while walking with Jesus and we're seeing supernatural things, he may have a lesson for us in it. And every time they're caught completely by surprise. And I would just ask you, are you caught by surprise right now? Is it outside the realm of your thinking that God could send a storm or send us into a storm in order to teach us, to show us, to help us. In fact, I wrote down these two things and I'll talk about them. I think that there are storms of correction where God is dis disciplining us and, and teaching us something. And then I think that there are storms of perfection where God is causing us to grow. And, and think about this. What kind of storm are we in right now? Is this a storm of correction or a storm of perfection? And I'll get back there in just a minute. But Jesus sent the disciples into a storm. Uh, he's not surprised by this. They're surprised by this. So let me just talk about this for a minute. The purpose of a storm. What is the purpose of a storm in our lives? Um, so let me just give you a few thoughts. Maybe, maybe things that after the message is over, you would think about these things this week, talk about these things. Uh, one, I would just say this. A storm speaks to you in a way that the sun cannot. A storm speaks to you in a way that the sun cannot. So here's what, here's what we know to be true, right? We all love sunny days. We, we all love when, when the grass is green and the leaves are on the trees. So let me say most of us love that. Some of us don't, but most of us love, I love that. 
I can't wait to put my flip-flops on. I can't wait to put my shorts on. I can't wait to cut my grass. Can you imagine that right now? I can't wait to cut my grass. I, I can't wait for summertime activity. I can't wait to play golf again. I can't wait to just be with my friends. I can't wait to be with you. That's the truth. I can't wait to be with you. But, but there are things that, that honestly, a storm can teach us that sunny days can't. Sunny days are just, there are days of enjoyment, long days, fun days. They call them the lazy, hazy days of summer. It, it's sort of like that, right? We enjoy them, but they don't necessarily teach us a lot. Storms can teach us things that sunny days can't. Storms teach us reliance on God. Storms teach us who's in control of our lives. Storms teach us that there is such a thin veil of control that we live with that we think everything will always be the same. And then suddenly a storm comes and it can wash away everything. Last week we talked about the scripture where Jesus told the story about the man who built his house on the sand versus the man who builds it on the rock. They both suffered storms, but the ones who built their house on the rock, their, their legacy stood and the ones who built on the sand Everything fell. They both went through storms. Storms are a fact of life. It's the bottom line. They're a fact of life. And sometimes you don't do anything to deserve a storm. You just get put in a storm. That's how it happens. So the purpose of a storm is that a storm can speak to you the way that a sunny day cannot. It's just the truth of the matter. It, it gets our attention, to be honest. It separates what's important from what's not important. Uh, it makes us realize quickly how precious life is and how fragile life is. I also wanna remind you of this, that after a storm, there's always calm after a storm, and after a storm, peace returns. And in fact, here's the truth of the matter. Sometimes we cannot appreciate how wonderful peace is until we go through something that disrupts our peace. And then when our peace comes back, we appreciate peace like never before. And, and it's just, it's a fact of life that all humans tend to take things for granted. Once we get used to something, we, we feel entitled to it. I'm not talking down to you. I'm talking more to myself. We feel entitled to everything being in, uh, uninterrupted and being always level and always peaceful. But the truth of the matter is, in this life, you will have trouble. You could say it this way. Uh, when Jesus said, in this life, you'll have trouble, he could have said it using this word. In this life, you will have storms. But fear not, I've overcome the storm, Jesus says, or I've overcome the world. So, so the purpose of a storm is that at times, storms can teach us what the sun can't. Here's the second thing, uh, if you want to fill in the blank. Let me talk about storms in relationship with Jesus. So storms and Jesus. What I love about this story, it said that he went out to them on the water, uh, intending to walk by. But when they saw him, uh, uh, immediately they didn't recognize him and began to cry out. And what, what did they cry out, by the way? Maybe they just shrieked in fear like, ah! But I think they did what we do. I think they probably cried out to God because if you're a believer and, and you have that relationship with him, I bet the first place you turn to in the middle of a tragedy, in the middle of a storm, in the middle of things that just are beyond control, I bet the first thing you do is say, God, help us. God, where are you? God, be with me. I bet you cry out to God. So that's what I think they cried out. I bet they said, Jesus, where are you right now? And what I love about this story, here's Jesus with a mindset of he's going to go and meet them on the other side of the lake. Apparently, the storm didn't stop him from what he's doing, but the disciples can't row against it. They're stuck. And Jesus walking by, uh, they see him. They cry out, Jesus. And what I love about this story is Jesus immediately gets into the boat with them. He did not tell them, hey, I'm trying to teach you something. Uh, you're going to be okay. He gets in the middle of the boat with them. So what does that tell us? It's good to know who's in your boat when the storms rise up. It's good to know that our God never leaves us and he never forsakes us. It's good to know that when you cry out to Jesus, he doesn't ignore you, but he comes and gets in the boat with you. And one of the other stories about Jesus in the storm, he's already in the boat asleep on a cushion 
And the disciples, they find the, the, the storm so intense, they feel that they're sinking. And, and these are fishermen who spent their lives on the lake. It must have been an intense storm. And Jesus seems undisturbed by the storm. Uh, I heard someone teach one time that any storm you can sleep through, you own the storm, and the storm doesn't own you. I think that's powerful. But this thought is true also, that when they cried out, Lord, don't you care that we're going to die? Jesus is roused up. He doesn't seem disturbed by them. He just speaks to the wind and the waves and everything gets still instantly. And in this case, it doesn't tell us that he said anything. It just says that he climbed into the boat with them and everything settled down. And isn't that the truth of how God works? That when his presence shows up in your life, in your family, in your circumstance, in your hospital room, um, <laughs> in your church, in your financial situation, in your job or lack of it, in your marriage or with your children, in the place that you fear right now, when Jesus comes into that situation, when his presence is right there, isn't it amazing how everything settles down? I just want to say to you right now, man, I feel his presence right now, right at this moment. And I just say to you, it doesn't seem amazing how everything just settles down. It just gets quiet, man. It just gets peaceful. He's with his people. He is not far away. He is not up on the side of a hill doing God things. He is right in the boat with us. He cares for us. He loves us. And he speaks to our storm, peace and be still. I wrote this in my notes. I just thought this was maybe a way to, uh, to sum up God's purpose in the middle of this storm. Do you think we're in it because he wants to sink our ship? Or do you think he wants to still our hearts? And I would say to you right now, man, God's purpose is not to sink the boat. If he wanted to sink the boat, <laughs> he's God. He doesn't have to use the means that he's using to do that. But these means, God can use what's intended for evil to do good with because he's good. And I just want to say to you, when you think about what's going on, your perception of this is absolutely important to how you will go through this. You're going to go through it one way or the other. But your perception right now is absolutely key in the success of going through this. Do you think you're in this so that your boat will sink? Or do you think you're in this because God can still your heart? And I think that the purpose of God is that he is stilling our hearts right now. He is causing us to turn to him. He is causing us to see that he is God over everything. God, I, I think I would say I would feel sorry for the one who is going through this without God right now. Their hope is in what? Government? Their hope is in the media? Their hope is in science? All of those things are fine and good and they have their place, but not above God. And I wouldn't put my life on those things. I would only put it on God. I would also say that when it comes to the idea of Jesus being involved in our storm, I just wrote down this sentence in my notes. See if you can comprehend what I'm about to say. Uh, if he has compassion for us, right? He has compassion. And I think that he does. If he has compassion for us, then it can change with circumstances. Like if I say to you, I have compassion for you right now, but then we go through space in life and you do something or situations change, I had compassion, compassion can come and go. So if Jesus had compassion for us, has compassion for us, that's wonderful, but it gives the idea that it can come and go. So listen to my wording, because it's not just semantics. If he is compassion, right? He doesn't have it, but he is compassion. Then it means it can never change, regardless of the circumstances. And that's exactly what he says about themselves. Uh, he says about himself, I am the same uh, yesterday, today, and forever. He is compassion. He doesn't just have compassion for us. He is compassion. He's the source and the definition of compassion. When you're going through it, he was with you then, he's with you now, and he'll be with you tomorrow. And you can put your faith, you can put your life on that fact. He doesn't just have compassion for you, he is compassion. He's the same always. And then the third and the final one is just simply this. Um, soften my heart. What, what can a storm do that few other things can do, right? 
Storms can soften our heart. Here, look, I'm going to say our nature, but maybe it makes it more palatable if I say my nature, right? So if you can't identify with this, thank you, your holiness. But for those who can identify with this, our nature is to quickly forget the lessons that God teaches us. So the last part of these verses, and I mentioned it before, they were completely amazed after Jesus gets in the boat and the storm dies down, and then it puts this as the back part of the sentence, the last words. For they had not understood about the loaves, their hearts were hardened or had become hardened. So the very first word of this scripture that we just used from Mark 6, 45, immediately, Immediately what? Immediately after feeding the 5,000 people. You remember the story? We don't have anything to feed them. What do we have? We have a few fish and a few loaves. Jesus gathers the fish and the loaves together. Do you remember the story? He blesses, breaks, gives it to the disciples, and while the disciples are giving it to the people, It's multiplying in their hands. So they did not just witness a miracle that Jesus did. They participated in the miracle of the the, the multiplication by being a part of what God was doing. You would think that forever they're without excuse to believe that the miraculous is possible and that God can do anything with nothing. He can win with a pair of twos, man. He can do anything. And you would think that they would be forever responsible to remember the miraculous, but their nature is a few minutes later, they enter into a storm and they forget everything that they just experienced. All of the dramatic, all of the miraculous, all of the possible evaporates in a boat in a storm. And I wonder right now if all of the miraculous that God's done for you all of your life has suddenly evaporated while you're in this storm. And I would speak to you, man, peace be still. And remember who you are. And more importantly, remember who our God is. He is well able. He is miraculous. And he can take anything. He's the creator. And he can cause it to be good. And I would just say to you that the very lessons the disciples should have remembered at this time, they forgot. And so we read the story and we go, how could they do that? Because them is us. We do the same thing. We hit a storm and our own survival, our own safety, our our own, how could this happen to us becomes so big that we forget about the possibility of what our God can do. We forget about the fact that he is able. Uh, Our hearts in effect become hardened. We forget. And so I want to ask you right now, have you forgotten? Uh, Are you not remembering every time that God's been faithful to you through your whole life? Faithful in your marriage if you're married. Faithful with your children if you have children. Faithful in your health. Faithful in your your job. Faithful in your dreams and your vision. Faithful with you throughout all of your life. Has he not provided for you? Has he not taken care of you? Has he not held you and been good to you? Think about that. Don't let your heart be hardened right now. Don't let let the storms that (laughs) that we're experiencing and going through right now become the predominant way that you see the world through. It's a moment in time. For sure, it's serious. I'm not downplaying that. For sure, it's, it's brutal. For sure, it's altering the way that things are. Look, here's the truth of the matter. When it's all passed by, some things will never be the same. For some of us, our innocence will never be the same. For some of us, um, our carelessness will never be the same. For some of us, uh, we won't be able to go back to normal and just think, you know, uh, all days are like every other day. For some of us, life is going to become more precious than it's ever been. Three years ago, I suffered a heart attack. And um, I, I, can tell you, I can tell you this about that heart attack. The one thing I know that I know is that I had a careless attitude about my life. Not that I... <laughs> not that I didn't love life, but I was careless. I just thought, when you have something, you tend to think it'll always be there. And then suddenly, when it's getting taken from you, how precious was the sun the first time I saw it coming out of the hospital? And how precious was the trees and the air? And how precious were my children? And how precious was my wife? And for those of you that have been 
part of our church. Maybe you remember me telling the story that the first night back in my house, I had trouble sleeping. I had many nights where I had trouble sleeping for many reasons. But one of the things I would do in the middle of the night, I just had this strange thought, am I, am I still here? And I would just reach over in the middle of the night and I would just touch to see if Chris was still there. And when I would just feel that she was there, it would bring such peace to me and such calm. I was just so glad to have one more moment. Just to know that he's there in your life right now, man. He's there. Just reach out in the darkness and touch him and know that he's there. And let it bring peace to you and let it bring meaning to you as never before. Ah, some things never change. So whether you're here in person or listening at home, I'm still a crybaby. So I would just say that storms have that way of softening our heart. And it's good. It's not bad. It is so good to have a tender heart. It is so good to just be open before him and not be so rushed and so weighed down and so heavy with all the things of life that our hearts get hard. Don't, can I, how do I say, don't go through this time and waste it. Don't waste this time. Let this small window of time that we have where we're all forced to go inside and shut the door and be with our loved ones or, or just be with him. Don't waste that time. Let that time do something good inside of your heart. Yeah, let me just say this last thing. I brought it up. I think that there are storms of correction and I think that there are storms of perfection. And so I asked that question, what kind of storm do you think this is that we're going through right now? A storm of correction is a storm of discipline. And God, whom he loves, he disciplines. The Bible tells us that. Uh, whom he loves, he also causes to grow. Uh, when, when we find ourselves being chastened, when we find ourselves um, things being pruned and cut back, it's for our growth ultimately that he does that to get more fruit from us. That's what the Bible says. So what kind of storm is this? Is this a storm of correction or is this a storm of perfection? The difference between the two is this did you cause the storm to happen in your life? So if it's a storm of correction, sometimes we're doing things or we're entering things and God lets the consequences come our way. But a storm of perfection to cause us to grow is when we've done nothing. It just comes upon us. We find ourselves in the middle of it. The disciples are sent into the storm. So just real quickly, this is a storm of perfection. You didn't do this. You didn't cause this. It's foolish to point to a person and say, this is simply, God can use this. And as much as it seems wasteful and as much as it seems like, how could this happen? God can use this to do good things. What the enemy intended for evil, God can use for good. Put a perspective on this place and this time in yourself as a believer. And I just want to remind you of this too, man. In the middle of why we're here right now, why why we're putting the effort out to do daily devotionals and why uh, we're still streaming our service and why we're ramping up and putting more energy to it than ever before is because we know right now the message has more power than it's ever had before. A storm also causes, the darkness causes a light to shine further than it normally shines. And if you want to be a part of that with us, man, I want to encourage you. Jump into the middle of our church right now. How can you do that? Follow us on the daily devotional and encourage people along there. Help us pastor people by being a part of our online groups right now. Tell people, send them. You can, you can forward the message out to people. Tell them about it. When you're giving, you, you're giving to your church right now that is still involved in ministering to people. Uh, just, just several days ago, uh, one, just one of the situations, a young single mother with children lost her job, needed our help. We will not turn people away in a storm, man. It is our job to be God in the storm. But it's when you get what we're still doing that it becomes important. If this is ministering to you, help us multiply it to other people out there. When you give, that's what it's doing. And I just want to be bold with you and thank you for your generosity. Let your church come out of this storm stronger than how we went into this storm, man. Let's be stronger coming out of it than how we went into it. Isn't that like our God? I just challenge you with that right now. I bless you. I love you. 
And I cannot wait to be back together with you. Next week, I'll give you some more instructions on what we're going to do for Easter. It seems good to me in the Holy Spirit, I believe, that we will acknowledge and celebrate Easter with our music and a message that, that talks about the power of the resurrection. But we will celebrate when we can all celebrate together. You know, Jesus said these really powerful words when it comes to him drinking of the fruit of the vine, the communion that we celebrate, the Passover meal. Jesus said, I won't do that until I do it with you in my father's house at the marriage supper of the lamb. And I just think in a way, maybe what I'm saying is, I don't want to celebrate the resurrection as a, a, a huge thing until we can do it and we gather together here below the Father and together we celebrate the goodness of God in bringing us back together. So church, I love you, I bless you. Uh, if you don't have the app, get the app. I'm sending out Monday through Friday a daily devotion. I think it's just a lifeline, an encouragement, uh, a light in the middle of this time. I think it will help you. Uh, obviously on the weekends, the message, there's just so many opportunities that the church is ramping up right now. Even some whole church activities uh, that we're doing, some, some uh, fun things online that we're doing for kids and that we're doing as a church as a whole. Just tune in. If you don't have the app, get the app. It's really important. Love you. Bless you. Can't wait to see you. Um, yeah, thank you.